G'day, welcome back to Bootlosophy. And if you're new here, my name is Tech. Uh, I acknowledge the traditional custodians of the lands that I'm living on here in Perth in Western Australia and that I live and uh, record on. This interview is with Luke Colby, the CEO of WC Russell Moccasin. I was uh, very excited to get hold of Luke because I, when I unboxed the uh, backcountry model of their uh, moccasin boots, I was actually very impressed with the unboxing. And then I put them on uh, for a couple of weeks, which is my usual break-in method. And I was so impressed, I did the review immediately rather than wear them for several months before I brought them back to you. So I contacted Luke and asked if he could spare a little bit of time for, uh, for me. So uh, I'd just like to remind you that if you like this video, don't forget to click on like. And if you're not subscribed, uh, I, I do interviews very rarely, but mostly I do reviews of boots. And uh, as I talk about the backcountry, you'll see a link to it pop up, I think over here or here, I'm not, I'm not entirely sure, but they will pop up and you can follow them uh, to go to uh, have a look at the original review. So without much further ado, uh, let's uh, go and talk to Luke. Editor Tech here. I'm just going to insert this uh, little piece before we actually go to the interview. I was very impressed by uh, Luke in his interview and I just wanted you to watch out on a couple of uh, business related points. Just um, listen to Luke's thinking about the strategy behind marketing uh, Russell Moccasins and the pricing, therefore. Uh, have a listen to Luke thinking about the strategy of building the brand, uh, including actually limiting what he makes in order to satisfy his perfect customer, his target customer. I also want you to uh, listen to Luke about how he intends to build the brand. He doesn't just talk about designs and creating uh, new ways of making the boot the product. He talks about what the brand is all about. He talks about how he looks after his employees. He talks about building a new site where there will be accommodation for apprentices. And that is building that business for the future. Let's go take a look. So I'd like to welcome Luke Colby, uh, the CEO of WC Russell. Uh, welcome to Bootlosophy, Luke. Thank you, Tech. I really appreciate you having me on and uh, excited to be in the down under, uh, even though I'm here. <laughs> yeah, I, I, it's always difficult to organize these uh, Zoom meetings because like, we're, we're a whole day apart, you know? <laughs> Absolutely. Well, I, you, you have to excuse me because I was almost going to grab a beer from the fridge, but I got coffee instead since it's morning there for you. <laughs> yeah, well, I, well, I've got my coffee and I was hoping you had a glass of wine or a beer. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. Well, I'm, a, I'm an evening coffee drinker, so I went ahead and made myself an espresso. Oh, well, when you when you get to an age, when you have a, a caffeine in the evening, you're not going to sleep. So a word of advice. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. Hey, um, I know you're really busy and uh, it's it's been tricky to try and get our times to align. So thank you very much for uh, being able to make it. Well, thank you so much for having me. I, I'm really been looking forward to this for a while, so I'm, I'm glad we were able to align it up. Great. Um, I, I have to say, you would have seen my unboxing video of the uh, the backcountry. Uh, I have, sent. yes, sir. Um, but, but you haven't seen the full review yet. And in fact, I'm releasing that uh, it's next weekend. Uh, Fantastic. Normally, what I do is I, I um, break in a pair of boots. I'd wear them solidly for a couple of weeks, and then I'll, I'll wear them every second day for another couple of weeks, and I put them into rotation. And I won't actually do a full review uh, until I've worn them for several months. But I have to tell you, Luke, I was so impressed with the comfort of the backcountry, I immediately grabbed them and did a review. It was just a revelation. I'm so excited to hear you say that. It was really funny when you sent me the email the other day, I, I wasn't expecting it at all. And I uh, saw your email come in and I was like, good gracious, he must have been putting these to the paces really quickly. <laughs> well, I, 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 have, I, I don't wear them to work because I work in a, sure. in a sort of professional office and with, with you know, really nice business casual suits. But right. every chance I get off work, I'm in them. <laughs> <laughs> it's funny to me because it, it seems to be there's kind of almost a, a defining point for most people. And um, I don't know if you know my friend Ben from Stitch Down, uh, yeah. Ben Robinson. Yeah. And Ben has been wearing, he, he used to buy Russell's off of like eBay and places like that, um, especially in the older days when most everything was made completely to order and there wasn't anything that you could purchase off the shelf. Right. And um, and he told people for years, he just like, that you just, 
you can't show somebody a pair of Russell's and expect them to understand that they have to put it on their feet and feel it because it's, it's very, very different the way that it fits, the way that it feels, the way that it moves. And um, I, I grew up with them. And so that there was never that point for me, but it's, it's always exciting when somebody gets to experience that for the first time. Well, I, I, I think the difference, you can see a pair of Red Wing uh, mock yep, toes. Yep. So I think in the boot world, everybody goes to Red Wing, oh, I've got a mock toe. Sure. And you get used to it. And then you put this. This is I think this is my second ever moccasin construction. I think when I was a kid, I had a pair of um, slippers. Yep. Uh, so I, I sort of a vague memory from when I was like 10 years old. Sure. Um, but but I think the main difference that I felt, which is why I was so impressed, is and I and I put this into the review video coming out next week. And by the way, this interview would probably come out at the end of August simply because of the timing schedules. Sure. But I said in my video that we're getting used to Goodyear welted or stitched down, uh, whatever type mock toe or whatever is. My feeling is that you you have a, a veg tan sole and right. you stand on it and you're on a platform. And you can you can go on rocky ground, the platform solid, your feet move. With right. the Russell mocks, you're wrapped up, I find. And like everything moves, you get you get Absolutely. total feedback as you as you're walking. I just find that incredible. <laughs> it, it's fascinating to me because my wife is a physical therapist here in the States, and we have a lot of conversations all the time uh, about different types of footwear and, and applications and those sorts of things. Um, and it's really fascinating to me because you know, growing up, uh, I wore Russells for for hunting, for quail hunting, those sorts of things. Um, and I never, I, I made a pair of stitch down boots for myself at one point in time, cause I was, uh, I had some friends from South Africa and they would always bring me back Feldscone, yeah. you know, the, the traditional fellies. And, um, I love the fact that they were so pliable and typically a wider toe box and those sorts of things. Um, but two years ago when I started getting more involved with Russell and, uh, myself and my business partner, Joe Julian purchased the company, um, it was really fascinating learning and it, it occurred to me that this thing that I'd kind of taken for granted, Russell Boots, um, that it's probably the only company in the world today that has its own unique construction method that even in the world of moccasins uh, doesn't compare to any of their different constructions. A lot of people uh, mistake a pair of Russells for, uh, like you see, like the pair of Red Wings, the, I guess those are 877s, but the, uh, the mock toe stitching on that for a, a true moccasin and then they also mistake something like a main moccasin, like a Rancord or a Quaddy for the same construction. Right. And what Russell, the Midwestern moccasin that Russell really perfected was really neither of those two camps. It wasn't a right. stitch down with a uh, kind of an aesthetic moccasin right. stitch. And it wasn't the very flexible, uh, but almost loafer like feel of the main moccasins. And so it, it you know, it's got that wider toe box um, it's got that more anatomical fit, but the number of layers is much more in line with the Pacific Northwest boot, but the feel yeah. is a hundred percent different. And it's, yeah. it's weird to explain to people. And, and if you look in our, I've got an archive that we did all the way back to our earliest catalogs in the early 1900s. Um, and all the information, it, it's really amazing that the way that we talk about the boots, um, the techniques, all those things haven't changed, but nobody really knows about them because we're the only company in the world. I mean, welted construction uh, is very common. Uh, moccasin construction is still fairly common uh, in the way of like a single vamp moccasin. Um, and then it's very common to have like the, uh, the mock toe stitch, you know, when right. people start talking about mock toes, but right. it's, uh, it's fascinating to me um, just the way it fits on the foot and allows the foot, especially for hiking and activities where you're going longer distances for your foot to really function anatomically the way that it was designed. Right. And so it's more of a, an accoutrement to the, you know, it's a leather sock. Yeah. Uh, a lot of people yeah. have come up with some really great uh, nicknames for Russell's. My favorite is either uh, hammocks for your feet or leather socks. <laughs> uh, the other one that's pretty good is all-terrain slippers, but they all pretty well define it. Yeah, yeah, it, it it is difficult to to uh, describe because even like all terrain slippers, I get that, but that might conjure up visions of being loose and floppy. But they're sure. not. They're they're no. sturdy. They they grip. You know, really, it it. 
I honestly can't explain it. It's really a, a combination of two worlds, you know? I'm in love with them. <laughs> Very much so. Yeah, and yeah. what's really interesting to me is that when I look at Pacific Northwest boots, I can certainly see the appeal for applications. Uh, it's similar to me like for, for cowboy boots. The way that I, I picture both of those styles of boots to me is that you're using that in applications. So for a cowboy where you're standing on the stirrups, where you're standing on your midfoot, and you're, that's primarily where the wear is going to be, and you need that structure underneath the arch of your foot. And then Pacific Northwest boots, obviously, going up and down ladders, standing yeah. on spikes on the side yeah. of trees. Yeah. But I feel like there's been this huge misconception of the fact that people should be wearing 10-pound logging boots with three-inch heels for daily wear and for hiking and hunting. And um, it, it, it provides a great educational opportunity for me with Russell to say, hey, there's this construction method that we've been doing for 126 years that yeah. allows you the durability where most of our customers are getting 25, 35. You know, I've got a pair that was my great grandfather's that are 75 yeah. years old and still in use. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So the same or even longer than Pacific Northwest, that construction, uh, but way more anatomical and better on your feet for long right. distance hiking and hunting. Right. We'll dive into the construction in a minute, sure. but l let's wind back and, and take a look at Luke Kobe. Just give a bit Absolutely. of background about yourself. So I'm, I'm originally from Southwest Georgia. My family is, is from there. And um, I ended up going to, to Mercer University uh, in Macon, Georgia. And um, in middle school, I, I began to start working with leather. I was homeschooled. And so uh, my sports were primarily outdoor driven. So it was either you know, in the fall, uh, I would I would do uh, wing shooting competitions, so like um, sporting clays um, or skeet or trap, and um, and then year round I would hunt as well as seasons came and went. And so uh, one of the things that I really noticed, especially here in the United States, is um, when I was growing up, the the products that we were able to get. So if you know of like a Bass Pro Shops or a Cabela's or these different outdoor retailers, the products were made so far away from the people who were actually using them that the function was lost in translation right. where, you know, you could tell that the person who designed the product had never really done what they were designing the product for ever. And I'm sure that there were specialty retailers and things like that, that I wasn't aware of at the time. But in my view, uh, the products that I was using as a, com a competitive shooter and, and as a sportsman, um, didn't match what my grandfather had and my dad had from, you know, the, the early years, you know, 60s, 70s and 80s. And so I set about designing for myself what I couldn't find or couldn't afford or whatever the case may be. And um, I was pretty good with my hands and I started working with leather. I developed the cartridge bag and, and that product that I designed for myself ended up becoming a, a company. That company is Kingfisher Leather Works. And, um, so I've, I've run that company since 2011. Um, we now primarily work with the resort and winery industry, making oh. drop proof wine and whiskey cases for travel and whatnot. And so uh, as I grew that business, um, being in Southwest Georgia, and, and you have to understand the United States, um, a lot of the hunting and wing shooting happens as a business activity. A lot of times people are, you know, you take a client out and you go on a hunting trip or something like that. Oh. And uh, a lot of that happens in Georgia. And so Susie uh, Fabricius and Lefty Fabricius, who are the owners of Russell Moxon from um, 1928 until 2022, their family had owned it during that period. Yeah. Um, we would do a lot of events together and happen to be neighbors at events. And uh, like I said, my family had been wearing them for, for I'm the fourth generation. And so uh, after getting to know them, they kind of became mentors of mine. And we would keep in touch. I would go up to Wisconsin to go see their facility. And we would work with a lot of the same leather suppliers and whatnot between the two companies. And um, in 2022, um, post-COVID, uh, we were at an event together. And uh, my now business partner, Joe Julian, who's a, he's a woodworker. So their family has been doing uh, gun rooms and libraries and kitchens all over the world nice. since the 1980s. And uh, we're at an uh, event together talking and it just came up that Russell Moccasin was at a, a kind of a, a point where they didn't know what to do. Um, right. Lefty, the CEO that I have now replaced, was 92 years old and he had run this business. Uh, he took over the business when he was in his mid 60s uh, in the <laughs> 1980s. So he had run it for a very long time and um, they didn't know what the future held. And so um, 
Joe and I took it upon ourselves to, to take this up as a stewardship opportunity, uh, knowing that both of our families have been customers and, and really the uniqueness of this type of footwear and the craftsmanship that goes into it, wanting to make sure that that doesn't go away. Uh, we took it upon ourselves and, and went through the due diligence process and ended up purchasing the company from from the family. And so it's been a it's been a wild ride, but uh, I get further and further in the leather industry the more years that go by. And it's uh, it's been an amazing journey so far. Yeah. I, uh, firstly, you mentioned uh, uh, Kingfisher Leatherworks. Uh, I'll, I'll, yeah. I'll drop a I'll drop a, a link to the website below. But sure. I, I've seen some of your products and they're really like really beautifully tooled with nice carving and tooling and. Um, it's clearly a luxury market end of Leatherworks, I guess. It is. So, you know, like I said, we started in the sporting industry. And then when I was in college, um, which you have to understand, I mean, you can probably understand this because I know you do a lot of hiking, is that when you design equipment for the outdoors, um, it, it has to be able to withstand, you know, a lot of different things. And so it was kind of a natural transition from making gun cases and, and luggage and equipment for sportsmen into making it protective cases for other things. A right. lot of sportsmen are also, they, they are wine aficionados or they right. have bourbon collections and things like that. And, um, and so the, the bottle totes and the things that we do are really modeled after turn of the century uh, case goods from uh, England and Scotland oh, okay. um, that, that people would have been traveling with. So the hat boxes and they would be carrying trunks of various sizes for uh, different things. I, I love looking at antique uh, products. And one of the things that I think a lot of people do is they look at an antique product and they say, man, you know, but they just don't make things like this anymore. And I, I look at it and I'm looking at the points of failure that even though it lasted a really long time, it's, it's this can still be improved upon. This is yeah. not a, a dead end that it, it can't be bettered. Um, yeah. And so what I do is is finding new purposes for um, centuries old techniques of the way that we do things. So one of the really unique things we do at Kingfisher is our stitching is all designed so that it can be restitched to the same holes should any failure happen down the road. And then we use a special presser foot to actually emboss the stitching to recess it on the surface of right. the leather so that the wear on the actual bag, be it in brush or, you know, just against your pants on a daily wear right. is actually on the leather itself and not on the thread which right. allows us to extend that uh, lifetime of the product. Of and a lot of that comes back to a, a concept and a coalition that we've developed between different companies, including Kingfisher and Julian and Sons and Russell uh, called Conservation Through Craftsmanship. And the idea behind that is that we feel that the best way to uh, be respectful of our natural resources and to be stewards of those resources is actually through craftsmanship. It's by making a product of such high quality um, and it's so well thought out that it can be used for several generations and there's no net waste. You know, the, the product right. is not going to the garbage and then another product's having to be purchased right. is actually being able to be serviced over a very, very long period of time. Right. Now, that is a fantastic segue into moving sure. into a 126 year old company. Uh, Absolutely. What, what and, and uh, I'm not sure if you know, but I'm a, um, a management consultant in real life. Right. So absolutely. one of my interests about people in business is what their vision is for how they grow that business. So how do you see your input into Russell Moxon? Sure. And and the way that I've approached Russell um, and to give you a little bit of contrast with with Kingfisher is um, the products we make with Kingfisher, my prior company that I now have separately is very much designed around wholesale market um, because you know even though we're using a lot of leather we're using incredibly high quality materials the labor and the way that they're designed um, you know it's a it's a luxury item but compared to the amount of labor that goes into a pair of, of shoes um, is in two two different planets and so we're able to build enough margin in there that allows us to work with specialty retailers because it's more of a product of you're in a place and you're gonna use it in that place and it's something that you have to touch and feel. And so that's the route that we've gone with that um, is more working uh, with resorts, with wineries and, and those different places to produce products that accentuate the experience that a person is gonna have there. Um, with Russell, uh, they were going the same route where they were doing a lot of wholesale um, throughout the Southeast. They had accounts, a lot of accounts in Japan uh, especially in the 80s, they had a height where 
actually 50% of all of our production was going to Japan to uh, different accounts there. And so when I was looking over the business model, one of the things that I realized is that over time, um, the compression that's happened between increases in labor prices and also, you know, just the, the talent that we require for the product that we produce at Russell, as well as costs in healthcare um, and those sorts of things have driven up the, the labor that goes into it. Because in Russell, it, it's almost inverse of, of Kingfisher, where Kingfisher, you're looking at the, the product cost and the materials are, are greater than the amount of labor that's going into it. And right. Russell, it's the compact opposite. And it's not that we're using less materials, it's the fact that there's so much labor that goes into making a pair of boots um, that the labor is really the majority of the cost in making a pair. I mean, we're spending- it, it's, still, upwards, it's, still heavily, it's still heavily handcrafted, isn't it? A hundred percent. So one of the things we don't use, we use a little bit of die cut operations. Um, but for the most part, we're using hand cutting operations because when you're making a pair of Russells, especially when you get into the multi-layer construction that we're famous for, you've got, you know, five, six, seven different lasting operations because you're starting from, let's say, a, a size 10 last uh, that you're lasting the most inner layer of. And then you're adding a layer around that that has to be lasted on a larger size last because uh -huh. obviously there's the circumference. Right. And then sometimes you're doing that on three different size lasts for right. one pair of boots. Right, right. And so, you know, for a double vamp boot, like the pair of back countries that you have, um, there's more than six man hours that go into that pair, not including the drying time that somebody's not touching that product in between steps. Right. And so that time is, is very, very expensive when you think about, you know, what all goes into that time. And, uh, the the level of craftsmanship that we require for that and so even though we're using a lot of materials there's a lot of leather that goes into that boot uh, the vast amount of the cost is going to be on the labor side and so when you look at that um, especially in the United States where people are looking at a pair of Russell's comparatively to a pair of boots that may be made in a country where somebody's going specifically to take advantage of, of lower wage prices and, and, and I say that with a lot of respect because there are fantastic craftsmen around the world that are doing some amazing things. Um, what I really appreciate and I'm proud of about what we do is that our products are very close to the customers who use them. And I think that's a very important part about any product is that you need for the product and the end user to be as geographically close as possible to, to make the best product possible. Um, the best axes in the world are made in Sweden because they're a forestry industry as a, as a nation. And so they make fantastic axes mm. um, and so on and so forth. I mean, the same thing with uh, denim in Japan, mm. you know, they, they use a lot of denim and so they, they create fantastic denim. Um, so with that, you know, that's where I looked at the business and said, we really can't do wholesale at all because, if, if we're going to be able to have this in even an attainable price point for somebody, and, and we've had to raise price, prices quite a bit as labor and different things have happened uh, to, to account for that. But even so, if we were to go into a wholesale type model, uh, like what we do with Kingfisher, you'd be looking at a $2,000 pair of Russells. Yeah. And so to, to look at that and say, okay, we're 126 years old. We've paid our dues. We've, we've been here. We've done that. We've gotten the T-shirt. We should be able to work directly with our customers um, and be able to uh, provide the value of, of uh, the least expense that we can provide them to be able to get into a pair. Because one of the things that I don't want to happen to Russell is for people to think that it's uh, a fashion boot that you just sit on the shelf and look at and it's, it's just pretty. Um, and I think that would happen if we were at that price point for a starting pair of Russell's. Yeah. I want people to use them and wear them and, and enjoy them in the field uh, or in hikes and you know outdoor activities. And so that's the direction we went. Um, and, and part of that was looking at our backlog and saying our backlog is being made worse by the fact of we're also having to fit in runs of products for wholesale accounts. Yeah. And so by taking that out, we went from uh, when I took over the company, we were at 15 months um, production time on, on orders down to was, uh, now. We, 
Sorry, Luke, was was a lot of that backlogging from COVID days? Because you, you took over just as we were all coming out of There's COVID. a good bit. Um, I, I took over right as we were coming out, and a lot of it was due to COVID. Um, Russell never stopped uh, production during COVID. Uh, so a lot of it was due to an aging workforce and the fact that um, the efficiencies uh, had gotten so... Um, just to give you an idea, when I took over, we had 126 individual models of, of boots and shoes. Right. Any of those you could get in single vamp, single vamp with a molded sole, double vamp or triple vamp. Right. Uh, most of the times they would do up to about five different leathers on the same boot. Uh, right. And then you could say, I want this boot, but I want it seven inches tall or nine inches tall or 15 inches tall. And the amount of... Um, I tell people all the time, it's like reinventing the wheel every single time you make a pair of boots when you do that. Um, and there's a lot of nuance to that. No one of our craftsmen to have that many different styles and that many different adjustments <laughs> are going to be able to do it the best every single time because mm -hmm. they're having to figure it out to a degree because I haven't done that style in that way at that height before. Mm -hmm. And that can lead to a lot of problems on the back end when a customer receives that. And it's not exactly what they thought it would be. And mm. so a lot of what I did, especially early on, was uh, tightening that up so that we focused on what we were best at historically, uh, what we felt like were our products that were wholly unique uh, compared to the other boots out in the market. Um, and then we're slowly starting to make our, our inroads back to those different um, abilities to, to be able to customize a pair of Russell's. Um, I think the Premier Builds has been a great way to do that. And the way that we've been able to accomplish that um, is by focusing on that standard sizing and then allowing people to choose certain things that really don't affect the performance of the boot as much as the aesthetics and, and more the adaptation for a certain terrain. So right. the Premier Builds program allows somebody that doesn't necessarily like or, or wants to adapt the standard version of one of our boots to, say, use a leather that's better in rocky conditions um, use a bison leather that, that is a little bit softer from the beginning and has that right. iconic look of bison uh, or to be able to change the outsole from, you know, or a Rashia, the commando lug sole to something like a day night or, yeah. uh, you know, something a little bit dressier. So it allows them to customize that boot, but it's still within a certain framework where those decisions have been pre-made on our team side to ensure yeah. that the customer can't go wrong. They're not going to pick a combination um, that's going to to not work well for them. Yeah, yeah. I I I think what you just gave there was a masterclass in looking at an older business and and how to transform sure. it. You know, uh, being really close to the customer, not being afraid of being niche if that suits the customer. Absolutely. Uh, not needing to appeal to a wide market if that's not your market. Uh, you know, some some really good thinking in that. So in in terms of I guess moving away from wholesale. I've noticed your social media marketing, for example, has increased uh, fairly sure. substantially since I've, I've known you. Um, so you're, you're focusing largely on the website at the moment, are you? Absolutely. And, and technology in that as well. So um, one of the things that uh, is really difficult is in this age of mass marketing where, you know, a lot of companies that have extremely high margins um, because they're making a product overseas and importing that in the United States or to another country is that the vast amount of their budget is going towards marketing dollars. And when you're sure. creating a product here in the United States, that margin doesn't exist to do that. And so a lot of that has to happen through word of mouth. It has to happen through um, referral business. And, and that's what we really excel at is that I feel like once a person tries a pair of Russell's, uh, especially if they get the right fit, if, if they get the right boot for their environment, it's hard not to become part of a little bit of a fraternity of people who wear Russells. And it's it's a little bit being, you know, I, I say it all the time that if you wear a pair of Russells, uh, you're part of a fraternity of some of the most interesting men in the world, you know, <laughs> President Eisenhower, President, um, President Coolidge, you know, Harrison Ford, Earl <laughs> Schaefer. Um, I think one of the most fascinating that I've found is, um, a gentleman by the name of Wiley Post, who was one of the first person to make it to the stratosphere. Um, he he wore the first pressurized suit <laughs> to get up that high, about 70,000 feet to so the edge of space. And this was in uh, 1933. 
and uh, and then uh, a lot of really neat explorers, including uh, the English king, you know, uh, King Edward the Seventh, who abdicated the throne, but his safaris were in our boots. Um, and then another British uh, gentleman by the name of Bruce Chatwin, uh, who I believe spent a good bit of time with the Aborigines in yeah. Australia. Yeah. Uh, and wrote a book called the the song winds i believe yep. the, the song lines and uh the song lines yes thank you and so you know he's got some pretty iconic pictures of a pair of russells slung around his neck and um it, it's i can't take credit for any of that because obviously it happened many <laughs> decades before i was born but it it gives me a lot of sense of uh of responsibility and a, and a weight there that um for some reason or another, and I think it has to come down to the the performance and um, the comfort of them. But for some reason, these people have chosen to do some of the most incredible feats uh, in world history in Russell Boots, and uh, and so it, it's it's very important to keep the company uh, very much focused on what our our overall goal has always been. Which, if you read back in our catalogs and magazines and articles back to the early 1900s, it's always been for people who were going outdoors, you know, whether that was trappers or, or hunters or hikers. Um, it was meant for getting out there. And yeah. so I don't mind being in a niche business. I love niche businesses because it allows you to focus and, and be the expert in a certain area. Um, you know, it, and that's where I think any business to be able to make those inroads today, you have to be able to to conquer a certain niche and say, you know, if somebody else has got a better mousetrap, um, I'll, I'll promote your mousetrap because <laughs> this is the area that, that we're best serving the customer in. But back to your question about, you know, marketing, um, that referral business has been a great part of that as we grow that. And then on the website, because sizing is such a hard thing, you know, we used to do so many different events um, Dallas Safari Clubs, all these big conventions where we would go and measure people. And um, one of the things that, that to be able to expand our market, especially internationally. So for you, for instance, you know, yeah. instance sizing is a huge problem. And, um, and so we had been looking for different solutions. And one of the things that's been a fantastic move for us has been that we work with a software developer uh, to develop a, a tool that would allow us to take accurate measurements of not only the heel to ball or the heel to toe measurement, but also the heel to ball measurement. Yeah. Um, because it's really important about the shape of the foot and the volume of the foot, even more so necessarily than length and width. Length. Yeah. Um, and so that's been able to allow us to get uh, a very accurate fit for the vast majority of our customers. Uh, and then for those that they still have a little bit of a different foot, that's when we go and, and require an in-person fitting because at that point, that's not something that you can do at home, you know, with a piece of paper right. and a bunch of measuring tapes. Right. Uh, but for the vast majority of our customers, being able to use that sizing tool and being able to yeah. get a reading uh, and confirm that reading based on those measurements, you know, and, and make sure it's accurate has been a great way of us reducing the returns and being able to take somebody that, uh, you know, we have, we have one of the, the shortest lead times in the industry because of the changes that we've made of, eight to 12 weeks on our made to order models. But even then, if you wait eight to 12 weeks on a pair of boots, you want it to fit. And <laughs> yeah. so being able to do that has really helped us in that front to be able to capture new customers. And, and also conversations like this, um, I think it's really important for us to be able to uh, have people put them on their feet and experience it and share that experience with others uh, in a genuine and an honest way. And uh, that's what this is all about. So I think yeah. both of those things, um, this included has been a, a really great direction to be able to open Russell to a broader audience. Right. Can you describe that sizing tool? I've seen it on your website, but sure. I haven't tried it. It's a you, you yep. scan a, a code and then go on from there. Yep. So if you're on your desktop and you go into a particular product, um, you click a little button that brings up a QR code and then it brings you from there to your phone. And what you do is you sit on a chair um, as long as it's a, you know, a hardwood, a floor, as long as it's not like a patterned rug or something, you're going to be fine. And what you do is you take a standard size card. So I use my driver's license most of the time. Um, you can use a, a credit card or a, you know, Sam's Club card or, or something right. like that. And what it does is it uses that standard size as a reference um, for your foot shape. And then what it's actually doing is it's calculating 
um, based on your type of phone, the fisheye effect of that right. and right. looking down at your feet and scanning both feet. And it's actually taking multiple pictures uh, to confirm that. And then it's giving a, a length and width measurement based on the mapping of the angle. So it's trying okay. to get as close as possible to level to take that picture. But uh -huh. even if you're level, you know, parts of your foot are going to be further it's away parallax. from the camera. It's, yeah, it's, it's not like a, you're going to have a little bit of a parallax. Um, and to account for that, the card is there to be able to look at the same parallax effect on the card. Um, and so the team there has done a very great job on, on that. Um, but what it allows us to do is then be able to recommend a size. And, and one of the things that I tell people all the time is even if I measure you in person and I take perfect measurements, I can make a boot that mathematically should fit you, but it doesn't mean that you're going to like it because yeah. foot, uh, a lot of it comes down to preference. Um, I like my boots really, really snug because when I'm going hiking, I don't want there to be any movement whatsoever. Um, and for some people, they want a looser fit because they want to just be able to throw them on very, very quickly or in some cases a heavier sock. Um, and so there's so many different considerations to have. Um, and Elast is really trying to meet those generalized expectations. Uh, but the great thing about moccasin construction, which is unique, is that because it's a full concentric circle around the foot rather than like a flat bottom mm. and kind of a D shape on top, mm. you have a lot of ability for length and width uh, to be able to conform to the foot without necessarily mm. stretching. It's it's more uh, like a belt can go around multiple shapes of an object. Mm. You put uh, your foot into a pair of Russell's and it's able to change the shape of that uh, yeah. of that circumference to match yeah. your foot. So one of the things that I do a lot of times is if somebody has problems with a high end step, that's not necessarily something you can measure with length yeah. and width. Uh, but what we do is I typically put them in an E-width boot because that that's that general yeah. width there can also be translated into height to accommodate yeah. that higher yeah. end step. And um, so there's a lot of great things that we can do there. But that tool has been a fantastic way to, to get really, really close. Uh, typically, you're going to be able to get it on your foot, and if you need yeah. to make an adjustment, a lot of times it's about a half size. So yeah, um, yeah. It, it's it's been a really great uh, change for us. It, it's interesting what you said about individual fit because I I sure. think um, people newish to boots, they might have worn a a work boot all their life. They might have worn an Iron Ranger, sure. whatever it is. Uh, get used to a fit, but I because I have a lot of boots, <laughs> I, <laughs> I find that my preference depends on what I'm wearing them for. So Absolutely. if I'm wearing a work boot out in the yard or something, I prefer a bit more movement because if I'm kneeling, I want my toes to sort of right. get grip. If I'm hiking, as you say, I prefer a bit of snugness because you want everything to move with your foot. But I, I've found the Russell moccasins, and it must be the construction, makes me feel comfortable in the sense that my toes are grappling right. and yet they're not slipping. Absolutely. And a lot of that comes down to the, the 40 last that the, that our Russell boots are made on is an adaptation of the Munson last. So as soon as the Munson last came out in the, around 1915, I believe, um, Russell was using the Munson last then. And then the, the, the 40 last was adapted because the Munson last was originally designed for stitch down and welted construction, um, which obviously it doesn't conform to the bottom of the foot. It, it's like yeah. putting your foot on a flat plank and then you, you have a covering of the top. Yeah. The, the fit that is really unique to Russell is how it fits the bottom of your foot. And if you look at, you know, if you were to take a piece of you know, paper and put your foot in ink and put it down, yeah. there's a very small profile of where your foot actually impacts the ground. And yeah. the rest of it is that curvature where it comes up underneath your instep, uh, for example. And so what a Russell does is it fits those curves on the bottom. Um, and unique to Russell is that if you look at like, for example, uh, the spacing on the eyelets on your Red Wing 877s over there versus your pair of Russell backcountries, what you'll notice is over the instep, especially those first five, six eyelets uh, are very close together. And then the spacing of the studs is further apart. Yeah. And what a Russell does is it it really is like putting a belt around the midfoot underneath the arch and over the top of the foot. And it allows the front of the foot, your metatarsals uh, to actually splay and, and perform their function of grip and balance um, without 
squeezing the sides of the sure. front of your foot. And yeah. so that that midfoot, you know, what we call the waist of the foot, you know, underneath the arch of the foot and then over the top, it the nice thing about that is it really doesn't change in circumference as much as the rest of the foot does as the foot swells uh, throughout the day of, you know, sure. heat and blood flow and those sorts of things. And so it allows you to get a really, really snug fit without sure. compressing the foot and, and eliminating the, the balance that you really need. And so that's part of the fit that uh, trying to quantify in words what that feels like is sure. that, like I said, it's it's like having a belt around the midfoot, but yeah. then all the rest of the foot free to to be able to wiggle sure. and move and uh, sure. conform but, to the ground. But also, I mean, I I find I don't know about your other leathers, but the the sure. trivet jack um, yep. is is super supple. So it is. clearly, that also has the effect of molding around your foot and and then shifting Absolutely. with your foot and giving well, volume. Uh, you know, the, the Timberjack leather is from SB Foot, and we've been working with SB Foot for, I, I would say, probably 50 years. It's a great tannery. Obviously, Red Wing, you know, all their leathers come from uh, from SB Foot. Uh, but one of the unique things of the combination of the leather and the way that it's constructed is that if you think about uh, how bins create structure, you know, if you were to take, a, you know, a flat piece of paper and, and put it on its edge and conform it into a circle, um, it has structure. It can then bear weight, you know, yep. sort of like a Coke can. Uh, and the same thing is true with welted and stitch down constructions that when you put that welt on there, or when you flange out the exterior of the upper to create that stitch down effect, you you create more stiffness. Yeah. And so uh, even if you're using the same weight and the same leathers in a stitch down or welted construction, a rustle is always going to be more flexible because those layers are concentric and they're completely flat one on top of the other, rather than having bins where it yeah. would create a, a difficulty for it to flex in that area. Yeah, yeah, plastic the, bag the versus an egg. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. terrific. Um, so let's talk about construction. Um, sure. My understanding of it is obviously it's it's it wraps around, it, it's, it's, uh, yep. it's lasted from the bottom, but you tell me. Sure. So what we start off with uh, on the backcountry, for example, is we have a heel counter that's hand lasted and it actually goes up underneath your heel. So you're actually standing on top of the heel counter as well as it going around the sides. Um, and we put uh, some people call it a rand. We call it a counter cover, um, but it's a it's a little flat piece of material that really just flattens out the bottom where your foot, your heel is going to sit so that you don't feel the lasting up underneath uh, that heel counter. And then uh, the the inner vamp on a Russell is is like a, a leather sock, um, and that is lasted, it's slip lasted, um, and that's what your foot is going to slide into. And so um, that performs a, a water resistant function. The other thing that it's really good for um, is it ensures that there's no hard lines that the foot is hitting up against. Um, so you know, on a stitch down or welted, you pretty much have a 90 degree corner on the sides of the foot. Uh, where there would be a gap, obviously, where your curved foot meets that 90 degree angle yeah. corner. And that that inner vamp allows it to, to hug very closely to the foot um, and then seal those seams that are going to be punctured through the exterior stitching on the outer vamp. So then the outer vamp and then what we call kind of the shell of the boot is made. And that's what goes around the heel counter, around the inner vamp. Um, and it's I, I tell people all the time, making a pair of Russells is like purposely painting yourself into a corner. <laughs> because it's like a cocoon, you know, there's layers upon layers on plumb layers and you're starting from the inside out. Uh, but in order to to create that effect, uh, you have to use some pretty interesting machines and techniques so that you don't okay. puncture what you've already done. So once you get that shell created, so the vamp, which is a, a single piece of leather that's wrapped from the bottom up around the foot, and then it's sewn to the quarters, the back stays, all that put together. And that kind of shell is lasted and then it's put down to a full uh, leather midsole. So that oak leather midsole, um, it's not just a welt on the edge, it actually goes completely from one side to the other of the boot. And that provides a, a base that's gonna conform to the shape of the underside of your foot. Right. Obviously the, the upper and the inner vamp um, being uh, chrome tan leathers are not gonna do as good of a job of actually conforming to the bottom shape. And that's where right. an oak tan leather does a really good job so you're standing on that full midsole that's stitched down in a Blake stitch um, to the vamp. 
And then once that's done, we then glue in the uh, the inner vamp to seal those Blake stitches that are going through the midsole. Right. right. Um, and then once that's done and it's all lasted together, um, the toe piece and the gusset are then put on top of the uh, the inner vamp. Right. And then that uh, the, the patented overlap stitch goes just through the outside. So we're stitching right. just through uh, the, the toe piece, through the yeah. vamp, and then back yeah. through the toe piece. And then yeah. it's it's a saddle stitch. And then uh, one of the interesting things, a lot of people think a saddle stitch is just two threads that just go through a hole this way and they come back again. And what's actually happening, if you look closely, is we're sticking the needles in like this and then wrapping one around the other. Ah. Uh, and it's an overhand knot in between each stitch. And what yeah. that allows for, for to happen is, let's say you were to cut one of those stitches at some point. Uh, obviously, it would be frayed at the point that it was cut, but it wouldn't yeah. unravel past that point because, yeah, because of the it's twist. literally got a knot. Yeah. yeah. And yeah. so, you know, that hand stitch is, is much stronger than a machine stitch because a lock stitch, uh, which uh, like a, it's the same thing that the, the toe seam on a, a red wing is done with. Yep. A lock stitch, the way that works is you have two independent threads that are yep. coming and then they're looping together in the middle and they go yep. right back to the same side. They don't actually pass all the that's way through. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and so that that's part of the structure there. But kind of the interesting thing and, and what a lot of people think is the welt is when we actually go back and then do a Goodyear, use a, a, a Landis machine to stitch a, a Goodyear stitch to our rubber midsole. Yeah. And that's where we we stitch through that uh, leather midsole to a yeah. to a rubber midsole. And a lot of people right. think that's a it's a welt stitch. What that that's stitch cool. performs. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. What that stitch performs is it allows us to add that that rubber midsole and the combination of those two midsoles back to back. Yeah. Um, what that does is, again, it helps seal those seams. Uh, that rubber becomes a much better bonding surface. But also those two layers together create some structure that takes the place of having a shank. Um, and so it stiffens right past that arch. If you can think of a bow, a bow bends very gently in an arc, um, yeah. whereas like a hinge would bend at 90 degrees. And what you want to prevent in footwear is uh, it bending right past the heel yeah. towards the forefoot because that would leave your arch unsupported and just hanging out in space. Right, right. And so a gentle curve, what that allows um, is for your your ball, which is very different. Some people have long toes uh, and their ball is further back. Some people have short toes and their ball is very for, far forward. And as you well know, with like a lot of dress footwear, even if your your heel to toe length looks perfect in a in a dress shoe, it can often be incredibly uncomfortable because <laughs> the shank is preventing it from bending where it should. Yeah. Uh, and so yeah. The idea of, of that double stack midsole is to be able to allow the foot to bend where it wants to bend, um, but then still support the arch in a way that, that keeps you from having any problems there. Yeah, yeah. I, I hate people asking me, what size should I wear in that boot you just reviewed? I'm right. a size eight. And I'm yeah. like, Yo, you're a size eight. What about everything else? <laughs> exactly, exactly. Uh, it's so much more about um, it's so much more about volume and it's so much more about the bone structure and where those joints end up a lot of times than it is actually just length and width. Uh, and, and length heel, and width heel, is heel easy. To, and heel to ball, I think, is critical. Absolutely. You know, it is. You, it's very just, critical. Yeah. yeah. And so, it, um, I'm sure you've seen those things where it's got uh, like different types of, um, you know, people groups and the different foot shapes, you know, about whether they're the foot shape is, is very kind of flat in the front or very yeah. curved on the sides. And that has a lot to do with the fit of the last two. I, I tell people all the time, you know, they're like, what size, what should I wear? And it's like, I can take a brick and stick it on a Brannock device and tell it it's a 10 D, but that doesn't mean it's going to fit inside of a boot. You know, it's the, it's the shape of the foot. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And I, I was surprised when you just said that this is a months and last, because obviously with the stitching, it, it yep. doesn't have that, that straight sort of thing, but right. you can see the genesis of it. I think it, it yep, in, absolutely. In, that, in that toe. And one of the things I think people ask me often is they might look at that and say, Oh, that's a tapered toe. And, I think the issue with me that I would say to them is, hang on, what's the heel to ball? Because right. it, particularly if you're in a dressy shoe, it could be quite yep. a long toe and you need exactly. that to, to fit your toe in. Um, so it's such a difficult thing. So this this um, this electronic sizing thing that that you've got is just I, I think it's it's the way of the future, clearly with online 
buying? You know, it, it's never going to be a hundred percent, but you know, our goal is if we can be, you know, right around uh, like most of the time with the, the sizing tool, um, you know, we have over 90% accuracy where somebody is, is getting the right fit uh, about 92% of the time with the tool. Um, the other 8% of the time, again, there's things with the volume of the foot. There's things with personal preference that you're never mm -hmm. going to be able to account for in a mathematical model. And I think that people that think that, you know, we're just going to be able to perfectly do something <laughs> in the future is, is a little bit naive because I always think there's going to be that feedback from the customer of this is not how I like it. And so you have to be able to account for that. But if we can get 90% of the way there um, with a, you know, a, a one minute process that is yeah. very uh, a, a low cost of time on the part of the customer, um, I think it's well worth it to be able to, you know, uh, to ensure that we're creating that efficiency and time for the customer. I, I've seen a video and I, I don't know whether this was a comedy video, but apparently there's a Japanese bootmaker who will send you uh, dental plaster. Oh yeah. You put that around your foot and send it back. <laughs> I've seen that many times and I've seen a couple of places that, that do that. And one of the interesting things that we found uh, when I was reviewing a lot of the orders that even our team had measured prior to my purchase of the business, but like when we were at trade shows and they would measure somebody at the trade show is that a lot of times if you make a boot to the, to the exact measurements of a customer, the boot is really starting out where it should end up after it conforms to the foot. You're always going to have a little degree of variation and, and stretch and conformity to the foot. So if you start where it really should end up, you're really going to end up with too large of a boot. Yeah. And so that's where I really like, if possible, for somebody to get into a standard size, one for the aesthetics of it, because all the parts fit nicely together. It's got good lines. The aesthetics are there. I've seen pairs of boots that, uh, you know, somebody has a really, really wide foot. And they make it and it, it, it looks I mean, it looks like Barney Rubble, you know, feet. And, and you know, a, a shoe should should take into effect your natural shape of your foot, but it should also make your feet look, look good. good. Uh, exactly. <laughs> and so, you know, I, I've seen some some really ugly loafers that that were really just a, 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 a boot around a very ugly foot, you know, to, <laughs> so it's, it's very funny. But um, that's to me where seeing a lot of times where it didn't work, where we designed a pair of boots around somebody's measurements and, and, and it got too large over time, um, really was kind of one of those things that are a light bulb to me that if we can get somebody in a pair and allow that pair to conform to their foot, um, it's going to end up being a much better fit than, than trying to make a absolutely perfect fit for their foot and then their foot doing what it does, which is, you know, make other problems and then it become too big anyway. Um, so... <laughs> And your foot will change in time anyway. It does. It does. Um, you know, people uh, that used to have their foot measurements on file would call up 10 years later and we'd make them a pair of boots and they'd have a pair from 10 years ago and they would wear that and that foot would continually stretch and conform to their foot because they were wearing it often. And you'd have a brand new pair made on 10 year old measurements that is way too tight because now their foot's splayed out and yeah. it's moved and what's happened? What, what happened? Why does it yeah. fit? Well, yeah. that pair has been molding for 10 years. This pair is what your foot was 10 <laughs> years ago. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Um, you mentioned the, your premier builds. Sure. Uh, and, and in terms of efficiency, sort of kind of limiting some of what you do. So yep. tell me a bit more about premier builds. What can you get into? So we, we have three different ways of ordering and we've designed it that way uh, to, to allow somebody to look at Russell Moccasin and decide, um, especially if you're new to the brand, where you want to start. Um, most people, once they start, they end up with several pairs uh, over, over the course of many years. Uh, and it's great because you're going to wear them for the rest of your life. So it's not like you're replacing a pair, but I need a pair for this and I need a pair for that. And so to, to give you a little bit of backstory, the, the three in stock models are our three most popular models. And we have, trick those out to the best of our ability for the use case that they're designed for. Uh, so your Zephyr, your, your professional hunter, and then the backcountry carry three very distinctly different uh, environments and use cases. Um, your Zephyr is going to be more of a daily wear and uh, low country boot where there's not a lot of terrain. Um, your pH is for flat ground trekking and hiking. Uh, and then your backcountry is for more Alpine, you know, daily wear work. And then also, 
uh, hiking in more mountainous terrain. And then from those three models, uh, the, the bird shooter was the kind of the original lace up boot that Russell was famous for the professional hunter, the Wyman, uh, the South 40, the big Cambo, all of those are variants of the bird shooter model. And so, uh, the, the next kind of tier of, of products we have that aren't just ready to ship, um, because obviously we're a small company, we can't do 50 models and have all of them, hundred pairs in stock. So we, sure. we focused on those three classic builds are models that we have designed, um, based on their historical, uh, types of materials and outsoles kind of your, your classic Russell's that are a little bit more specialty use cases than the three in stock pairs, but right. are effectively an extension of those uh, models that we've designed and kind of our classic uh, aesthetic. And then when you get into the premier builds, those are models that we've designed with a range of materials uh, for the use case that still fits within the boot. So I give the example a lot of, we're not going to make you a pair of loafers that has a mountain climbing sole on it because that doesn't make any sense. Uh, but to take a boot that let's say the, the Zephyr model and then be able to dress it up with a day night for daily wear to wear uh, up underneath a pair of khakis and it looks like a loafer and to be able to use in more business casual situations. Um, the South 40 to take that from uh, a lot of guys wear that in South Dakota where it's hilly but not super mountainous. Yep. And so they want a, a very flexible sole that they can wear for, you know, hiking 10, 12 miles a day. Um, and then in some cases, somebody wants to take that model and they're in Alaska and they're hiking at, you know, 8,000 plus feet of elevation. And they want something with a lot more midfoot support for standing on scree fields and rocks. And so we've got all those different options built in there. So within each different model, you're going to have um, about six different leathers and about five to six different outsoles. In the case of the professional hunter, the Joe's pH, you also have three different colors of Scottish twill to choose from for the quarters. Um, right. So it adds kind of another layer of, of, of customization there. Um, but a lot of times it's uh, one of the things that people have always loved about Russell is the ability to have a little bit of a different aesthetic to match yeah. your personal preferences. Yeah. And so the goal of the premier build is to be able to do that uh, quickly and with as little risk as possible in the customer's part where it's not a full custom where, you know, it, it'd be a $5,000 pair of boots with a custom yeah. last and all this stuff. And yeah. then we're 15 months out where yeah. you can get that in eight to 12 weeks. And then we also include an exchange in there so that if you order the wrong size, we just put another one of the same right. specifications into production. Right. Uh, and that's worked really, really great. Um, it allows people to, to be able to customize it. If you've got a trip or something coming up or, you know, you're going out to Pacific, the, hike the Pacific Crest Trail or you're going, uh, you know, to a, a certain trip or a certain event, you can, you know, within two to three months, uh, order something specifically for that and have it. And the great thing with Russell's is not you don't have any really break in period. I would say yeah. you wear it for 24, 48 hours. And other than the heel counter molding, you're, you're good. To you're go. done. Yeah. 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 Uh, tell me, I, I I saw that on the site, but I didn't understand the the use of twill on the on the shafts, the yep. canvas. What's the advantage of that? So that boots um, back in the 1970s, and and it really started back um, in the the 1930s. A lot of our customers uh, were going on safari in Africa, so <sighs> that's where you had um, Dennis Finch Hatton and uh, King Edward the Seventh at the time. Uh, we went to Africa and they, you know, right around the advent of the camera, there's some great documentaries on that trip that they took. Um, then you had uh, Robert Rourke, the famous writer who went over there and he hunted and wrote about safari. And, um, and then Bruce Chapman, all these different guys who were taking boots over to Africa and to Australia yeah. uh, for, for planes safaris. And in those different areas, one of the things that you run into is you need a boot that's incredibly durable because you're hiking through the brush. Um, and, you know, thorns this long yeah. and those sorts of things. Um, but the amount of heat that's there is yeah. if you were to wear an all leather boot, um, I tell people all the time to wear a full thickness sock with their pair of Russell boots, because even in the summertime, because what that does is it allows space around your foot for that hot air and moisture to escape. Right. Believe right. it or not, the, the biggest water problem when it comes to boots is not necessarily from water getting in. But it's right. the fact that moisture from the foot up to about two cups of water a day coming off your right. feet, not being able to escape. 
Two cups. Two cups. Oh, and oh. so that's where, you know, a lot of that comes in and, you know, uh, humidity coming off your foot of, of escaping around your foot. But if you take a really thin sock and put it in an all other boot, you're really providing no space for that heat and moisture right. to escape. Um, so like we have socks that are, are not a, like they're a little bit of a lighter uh, material that breathes better, but it's still a full thickness that allows that heat and moisture to escape the foot. The alternate method is is doing something like the professional hunter that right. has the twill quarters right. where that's an 18 ounce twill. So it's incredibly heavy twill. Uh, it, it's really, really durable. But having those quarters open allows that heat and moisture from the foot to escape there. And as you know, moisture on the foot, if it stays there, um, makes your skin softer and that leads yeah. to blisters. So yeah. if you're doing a safari where you're hiking 10 to 15 miles a day, um, yeah. you know, you don't want blisters. So allowing that heat to escape uh, and allowing your foot to stay drier uh, for yeah. those environments is really what it's for. I tell people all the time is if you're going to an environment that you're encountering a lot of water, um, the pH is not designed for that. It's really for, you know, and, and here in the United States, people wear it um, in the, the summer and fall a lot of times yeah. in the drier yeah. months. Uh, and then obviously in, in Australia and then in, uh, in Africa, um, they're wearing it year round because it's an arid environment. Sure. Yeah. All right. Terrific. I'm really pleased that been, to be able to meet you and go through this discussion. So um, yeah, absolutely. That, that kind of ends what I'm interested in with, with Russell Moccasin. You've told me a lot. And I'm, I'm really, really impressed by uh, your business attitude into the boot world, into the boot Thank maker. You. And you, you actually have a finance and legal background. Is that right? I, I do. So my my background, my degree uh, was in finance and um, I went into to mortgage finance for a year um, when I first moved. My wife and I got married. I, I finished college in three years so that she and I could get married because she was ahead of me <laughs> one year. You have good motivation. That's amazing what you can do. Uh, but when she and I got married, I moved states. So I moved from Georgia to Alabama and moved Kingfisher, moved my company. And I'd always done Kingfisher while I was doing something else. So I did it all through, you know, all through high school, all through college, all these different things. So I was used to doing that uh, and having something else to do. So I went into uh, the mortgage field and, and uh, did that and became a licensed loan processor and uh, all the regulatory side of that. Did that for about a year. And uh, Kingfisher had just grown to the point at that point that um, I, I wanted to be able to I love the challenge and the creativity that, that business gives you. Um, I love being able to work with my hands. I'm a, I'm a craftsman at heart. And, uh, and so being able to, to take uh, a lot of those skill sets on the financial side and, and the, the business side and, and be able to apply that to craftsmanship based companies uh, and create that not only uh, fiscal sustainability, but also the, the stewardship of materials and the, the, uh, the actual trade itself is something that I'm very passionate about. and uh, But that's how I, I made my way back into the leather side. I, I'm very impressed with the strategic thinking. I, Because of my reviews of newer boot brands, not sure. so much someone taking over, but um, so they, they ask me sort of things on pricing questions and stuff. Right. And I often say to them, when you're enthusiastic, you're an enthusiastic boot maker, you want to make everything. Yep. And often you you try to please everybody and you please no one. Sure. So this the strategy of really being understanding your audience and 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 meeting them is I think is critical as you found out. So where where do you go from here, Luke? Where where does Luke Kobe go? Where does Russell Moccasin go? It, it's exciting, you know. We're um, we just we've been in a building in Berlin, Wisconsin since 1950. Um, our original building, I wish that was still around, but it burned down in the 1940s. Um, during a big fire. And so um, we had been in this building since 1950 and it, it got to the point where uh, we had 25 employees operating in about 5,000 square feet. And so it was everybody was on top of everybody. And really to be able to get that to where I wanted it, we would have had to level that building and start from scratch to really make the code updates and the, the safety things that I wanted to do. And so um, my background a little bit before the, the finance side was in um, downtown development authorities and, and being able to take buildings. Uh, I was involved in a lot of projects back home of taking buildings that and repurposing that uh, and trying to do something with historic buildings. So one of the things that we found in Berlin was um, 
pretty much diagonally across the street from us, about 50 yards away, was a, um, a Catholic church and school that was built in 1926. Uh-huh. And uh, it was a, a full kind of square block of, of city um, that had the, the school, it had a house on the property that was parsonage, and then it had uh, the church building. And the, the church that had that, they built a new facility and a new school and so we were able to, to purchase that property that was a lot of square footage, really, really well taken care of and take wow. the school portion. And uh, because it was already large rooms, very open floor plan, um, be able to take that and turn that into our new production facility. So now we've got just shy of 12,000 production square feet there and then plenty of, of uh, temperature controlled storage and offices and then on-site housing for our apprentices and then room wow. to grow as well in the future. And so Russell, and so many people think that with business that you, you, you need to get to this massive point where you know, you're know you trying to do an IPO or something like that. Um, what I love about companies is, is trying to find that equilibrium point where you're able to maintain your craftsmen, where you have that constant filling uh-huh. in of our craftsmen have been there 30, 40, 50 years where there, there's people underneath them that are training and there's plenty there, um, but they're also able to stay niche and stay lean um, so that you know financial crises, pandemics, all those things that you can't plan for that we're not caught high and dry in those different times. And so um, we're still trying to find that equilibrium point of, of where, um, where the, the growth not necessarily ends, but where our market, where our niche, where we're best served, and then continue to become more efficient in that. Um, and I don't necessarily think it's it's to the moon. There's there's going to be a place in there where we find that um, we're able to create that sustainability. We're able to grow and continue to invest in our employees and in our process, um, and and continue to dominate the niche that we've always had. Uh, and I think at that point, it's going to be a great opportunity to be able to share more of the brand side of Russell Moccasin as a historical heritage brand of 126 years of history and really be able to to create some other products, uh, maybe not even necessarily footwear to accompany those customers. One of the things that um, I always think about is, is how when we're creating a product that a customer is going to use for 25 or 30 years, at some point other than maintenance on that product, they don't need us anymore. They're happy. Yeah. They're a satisfied customer. They got six pairs in the closet that they wear all the yeah. time. What do they need us for? And so if you're a business with that sort of model and you're not designing a product to become obsolete where they have to purchase from you again to fill that need, how do you stay in business? Um, we're always going to have more customers that can come into the fold. Um, but what we're also going to do is find new ways of creating products uh, that accompany the lifestyle that, that help support uh, you know, that's where Kingfisher, in my experience, there have other products and bags and equipment that that go along with uh, the same customer that Russell has is is going to be really important uh, and providing other things that somebody who already understands the quality and the value and the the reputation of Russell uh, are already going to understand and and be a, a kind of a pre built customer base for. Yeah, yeah, terrific. I really like the idea of the brand is not just a product, but it's how you treat sure. your employees, housing your apprentices. Absolutely. That's fantastic. It, it just yeah, it, there's a great, uh, I don't, I'm sure you've listened to Simon Sinek some, um, and, and one of the, the interesting things, and I, I think one of probably his best things that he's talked about is uh, kind of this infinite game kind of uh, concept. And I think it's very important, especially as a steward of a 126 year old brand to have that mindset of, um, we're not just trying to win today, you know, we're trying to continue so that another 126 years can yeah. go by and we're still providing that same level of quality and hopefully even greater as we don't just stagnate, but also continue to innovate. Terrific. Luke, thanks very much. I really appreciate your time. Well, I sure appreciate you, Tech, and I know it's uh, I appreciate spending the morning with you and having a good cup of coffee. So. <laughs> and uh, have a great night. You can have a beer now and relax. <laughs> I appreciate it. Terrific. Thank you. And we'll be in touch again soon, I'm, I'm pretty sure. I'm, I'm loving to watch the progress of WC Russell and Co. And uh, I'm loving wearing the boots. So uh, we'll be in touch. Take care. Fantastic. So there you have it, guys. 
Uh, I hope you really enjoyed that interview. It was it was to me quite eye opening, and I'm always interested to uh, look into the uh, business thinking of bootmakers because uh, I think bootmaking and it is really a mixture of uh, commercial nous to be a success and artistry and creativity. So uh, I, I look forward to see what what Russell Moccasin does in the future. I hope you like this video. Don't forget to click on like. And if you're new here, please click on subscribe. Even if you're not new here, only half of you subscribe. So you might as well subscribe. In the meantime, take care out there, guys. Uh, and I'll see you soon in the next video.